Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's been four years since we got off the plane. I think it was Beijing, coming to China for the first time. So in this video, I wanted to recap on the last four years. So stick with me. I took some notes. I want to explain the story of how I got here, how we got here, because it's pretty unique and fascinating. I want to say something about the challenges I've had since I've been here in China. Uh, there's quite a few, some you might not expect, so stay tuned with that. Uh, I wanted to say where I currently am, what's going on right now after four years of acclimating, adjusting, uh, just being in China as a foreigner. <laughs> Hello. And then I want to recap on some of the future plans that we have. You know, what, what do we have going for the future? You know, I'm a planner, so I always have a plan. I want to plan for what's going to happen in the next one to five years. So stay tuned. Uh, some parts you might not find too interesting. Just skip forward a little bit. I promise I'll walk around. I'll try to get some unique background shots of what it's like in my neighborhood. And I'll just do my thing and tell my story. So, the story starts in Arizona. I was working as a county planner for Mojave County, Arizona, right? And we heard about the pandemic. And uh, Xingyi was experiencing some racial um, disparities. So because the pandemic was starting to get bad and rumor has it, it was originating from China, and she looks necessarily Chinese. She was starting to get some people, and I'm not saying all people. I'm not saying it happened very often, but it only takes one or two people to really, really get you going and ruin your day. There were a couple of people that were like, ah, you're Chinese, since you're protecting yourself and wearing your mask, you must have brought the virus over from China. So my point is, America wasn't, wasn't uh, too friendly a place for Xingyi, my wife, when she was living there. So much so that she didn't really want to leave the house unless I was with her. People would treat her different. Uh, when I was with her, they'd, you know, no problem. But when she would go out by herself, man, she had some bad experiences. So, this helped influence our decision. Uh, when the World Health Organization declared an official pandemic, we didn't get scared. Uh, I have to say we had a really rational conversation, kind of put together a checklist about advantages and disadvantages of staying or moving to China. You know, we, we kind of had a rough plan to eventually move to China, but this just like hyper accelerated our plans at like warp speed, right? So to make a long story short, um, Sunday, we started thinking about going to China. Monday, I went to work, quit my job. You know, I handed in my my resignation. I had two weeks paid vacation saved up, so, uh, or three weeks. We decided overnight to move to China, packed all our stuff up, and in five days sold everything, and we were on a flight. Well, we were supposed to be on a flight to China. That's where the story starts to get interesting. Oh, here's my friend that cleans up our neighborhood all the time. He's awesome. Hello. So anyway. We were supposed to fly out from Las Vegas, so we sold our cars, we sold my computer, all of Xingyi's instruments, we sold anything of value, packed up two boxes, sent it back to my parents in Wisconsin through USPS, rented a truck, and we were supposed to fly out of Las Vegas. Now, there was our first challenge that we ran into. The day we were supposed to fly out, there were some confirmed COVID cases in the control tower shutting down the Las Vegas airport we were supposed to fly out of. Now, we we're supposed to go from uh, Las Vegas to San, San Francisco, California. And then from San Francisco, we were supposed to fly overseas to China, right? So now our flight's canceled from Las Vegas, and we didn't know if we were really going to make it or not. So we're like, okay, we got a connecting flight over in California, we'll just drive to that airport, not thinking that because the airport in Las Vegas shut down, it would disrupt 
the whole chain. So, you know, we drove overnight, dropped the car off at the airport. You know, we, we rented a truck, we dropped the truck off at the airport and found out that we couldn't just get on our connecting flight. That's not how it works, right? So for the next eight hours, Singy and her mom just scoured the internet, just totally searched everything to get us a flight, which is extremely challenging because flights were getting shut down. They were fully booked. Like we really didn't know we were, we were flying by the seat of our plants. We, we already told our landlord that we're not gonna stay at, uh, at uh, the place we were staying at anymore. Eventually, Singy and her mom found a flight at the exact same time and double booked us. So they bought two tickets twice. Because uh, when you have two different passports, it's, it's challenging. Now, we found one through Taiwan, but the layover was so long, I could stay over, but she couldn't. Anyway, to move the story along, we got two tickets. So we're on the flight, and, and we're talking in the airport. There are people wearing full hazmat suits. There were like ski masks. You know, everybody was doing absolutely everything they could. It was crazy to try to protect themselves from the invisible virus we knew nothing about and might kill people, right? Oh, we're talking like like movie level type scenario where you're at an airport. You don't know if you want to eat across the table from another person at the restaurant in the airport because you don't know if they're sick or not. Anyway, to move the story along, we get on the airplane. We fly, to, we fly to Beijing, and they have a whole, like, the, the, the further and further along on our trip. Hello. 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 I can speak a little Chinese. My Chinese is getting better. So anyway, uh, we get to Beijing, and the farther and farther down the trip we are, the more and more it seems like a movie scenario, like pandemic, right? They, uh... They have a whole section quarantined off from the airport, like special for incoming flights. They got everything really, really under wraps. It's, it's, it was probably one of the most coordinated things I've ever seen. So plastic sealing everything off. They put you in a hotel room. Okay, you get off the plane and they escort you down. They're spraying down your luggage like constantly with a bleach water solution you know, to sterilize everything. They're taking every precaution necessary to make sure that everybody is sterilized and as safe as possible and quarantined off from anybody that's in China, right? They're just trying to mitigate the spread as much as possible. It's awesome. So they take us from the airport, they put us on a bus, and the bus has got plastic all around everything, sealing the driver away from... You know, the passengers, the drivers in a hazmat suit, pretty much every every single person that wasn't on the plane with us that we saw after we got off the plane was in a hazmat suit. We didn't see anybody that wasn't wearing a hazmat suit. It was surreal. So they brought us from the airport in a special outfitted bus, you know, a regular bus, but with lots of plastic on it, uh, to a hotel. And they gave us dinner, um, kind of like cafeteria food. Right, and the first hotel hotel that we went to was an unfinished building. You know, they're really they're really scrambling to try to do the best they can. So no judgments here. And we're talking like unfinished. It has windows, but there might be like a little puddle of water on the floor. And uh, Singy and I had to, my wife and I had to quarantine in a separate room, and we both had to pass a COVID test before, you know, the next stage of, of our trip. So the first night, we couldn't even, like, talk to each other because we didn't have a SIM card for our phone. There was no Wi-Fi. You know, we had just gotten to the country. And we, we went from off the plane to the, ho to the hotel. And again, I'm not complaining about the way things were administered at all. I think it was actually really, really well done for the short period of time that China had to deal with people coming over the border. They... And I, and I want to say something else. I was never treated like a lesser person because I was a foreigner. They treated me exactly like they would treat any other Chinese national citizen coming across the border. I, I never had any kind of racism since, since I arrived in China. So this, this brings us to 
the first COVID test we had to take, which was the nasal swab. Wow. Okay. I have never been so disoriented in my life. They stuck the swab pretty good into my nose to the point where I lost my balance and had to grab the girl's leg next to me because I'm sitting down on, on the bed while they're doing it. It was an experience. It was a, it was a unique experience. Now, today the weather is very good. It's hot. So, uh, we passed that test. They take us to another hotel. Uh, I take that back. They took us to a big, like, expo hall. This was to try to coordinate the people that were arriving to account for them in the next leg of their trip. So everybody landed in Beijing, and then they had to go to different parts of China, you know. So uh, there were all of these different workers. And again, everybody except for the people that got off the plane, hazmat suits all the way. So we went to this expo and since we were going to Lanzhou in Gansu, Gansu is like the county or the province. Lanzhou is the city. Uh, there was a booth for that. You know, there's a booth for Shanghai, there's a booth for Lanzhou, there's a booth for Guangzhou, there's a booth for just about every major city in China or the region, right? For the and uh, they set us up, and again, hazmat suits, people are walking by, spraying down every bag with, uh, you know, a sterilizing bleach-type solution. Uh, and again, I was treated really well by everybody. So they get all our paperwork in order, and we get on another bus, a very small one, outfitted with plastic to protect the driver in a hazmat suit. They brought us to another hotel. It was kind of afternoon by this time. We stayed overnight. They fed us. I know this is getting a little long-winded and boring, but to make a long story short, we went from airport to makeshift hotel, bad COVID test, to the expo hall to get uh, recorded and the directions on where to go next, to another hotel, to another airplane, to Lanjo. From Lanjo, we get out of bus straight to a hotel. Huh. Hello. I love dogs. video. So, I told them that uh, listening to the Sichuan dialect is hard. I said, I want to take a video and tell everybody back home. Sorry for the interruption. But anyway, it's really it's really time. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, thank you. Oh, and then you can go and Anyway, okay. I, I, I'm doing this video unedited without any distractions. So, Long story short, we went to China in a very short period of time. They handled us as well as they could. You know, it wasn't a five-star experience but we're okay with it if you want the biggest relationship challenge with your significant other the last part of our trip was two weeks actually 12 days because we had already spent two days in china and they subtracted that from the two weeks of quarantine that we had of daily covid tests in a single room hotel room with your significant other they allowed us to quarantine together and i don't know if it's worse being trapped in a single room hotel by yourself or with your significant other uh i've only had the latter experience and boy that is a relationship challenge if one of us kind of got upset with the other you had to go sit in the bathroom to get away because you know uh they didn't lock us in per se like they didn't lock us in but you just knew there was nowhere to go so you didn't leave and it was that was kind of the rules um 
wasn't wasn't authoritarian by any means. It wasn't crazy. It was kind of what we did to help mitigate the spread of the pandemic. It's just what we did. Uh, we got through it uh, after 12 days in Land Joe in a hotel room. We got let out. And it was the weirdest experience ever because, you know, you get locked up, locked up for two weeks and then you get your freedom. And, you know, we're talking about going from America, from everything being relatively normal, to going through the experience of quarantine and, and, and hazmat suits and different country. And then you get let out in China and it is, you're, you're just in such a shock. I will admit, we got to Xingyi's parents' house and something broke in me. I don't know what it was. Just uncontrollable emotional crying for like, I don't know, a good solid five minutes. I just couldn't help myself. You know, I think it was it was finally like taking a breath and knowing that knowing that everything before isn't anymore, and uh, everything from now forward is going to be different. You know, different person, different life, different place. That's just something to stop and reflect on. So, okay, bookmark this. We're gonna go on some of the challenges on the experiences that I've had here in China. Okay, uh, one. First and foremost, the language. The language is challenging. The language is really challenging. Uh, at first, there is no progress. You put all this time into trying to learn the language, the mechanics, the tones, the pinyin, which is the English version of how each character sounds, the actual characters themselves. Uh, the first two years is a lot, and I mean a lot, of time spent with the work and little to no noticeable progress. Almost none. <laughs> now, oh, these are my friends at the gate. Uh, think of them as like concierge, so if you forget your keys, if you need something, if you need directions, they totally help you out. So anyway, the language. Um, it takes five years. It takes five years to get to a fluent uh, way. So the first two, two to three years, lots of studying, lots of hard work. You're really training your brain. You're exercising your brain to depict the words individually, to be able to remember and learn the mechanics of the language, the tones, uh, sentence structure, how to say things. By the fourth year, you're starting to be able to put sentences together pretty comfortably, right? And uh, by the fifth, but between year four and year five, it's like a logarithmic scale. You start to learn the language in the language and your brain is finally in shape enough to start using the language comprehensively. And that's where I'm at right now. So I can, I try every chance to talk to every Chinese person that I can. And uh, in one year, I'll be fluent. I'll be able to talk with anybody. So. So that's that's the language challenges, uh, cultural challenges. We'll, we'll just say it. It's it's a little racist, but I I wasn't used to seeing Chinese people. It, I was used to seeing a mix of people, you know, black people, white people, uh, Hispanic people, Chinese people. But now, I'm in such an isolated part. If you watch this video, I have literally been the only foreigner in the whole video, because in my neighborhood there aren't many foreigners. It's all Chinese people. So it took a long way, a long time to get used to just seeing Chinese faces. It took me two years before I could discern Chinese facial features. They're different. Uh, you know, there's that trope, like all Chinese people look alike. Well, all Chinese people look alike to people who aren't used to seeing Chinese faces. Same thing in reverse too. I, I'm, again, call me racist on this one, but there's one other white foreigner in the neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood, well, that was like two years ago, but everybody in the neighborhood mixed the two of us up. One of them was like, ah, oh, you're my kid's English teacher. And I'm like, no, I'm not an English teacher. They're like, no, I know you, you definitely are. You teach my kid English. I'm like, I'm not an English teacher. It's not me. I can't. Anyway, 
recognizing Chinese people, another challenge. Work visa. A work visa is also very challenging. Uh, you need certain documentation to get the right permissions to work in China. The majority of people are teachers, primarily English teachers, music teachers, sports teachers. You have to have a skill that Chinese people don't possess. You need to be a valuable contributor to the Chinese population. And getting the work authorization is, is challenging. You need two years of experience in whatever field you're applying for. So I was employed as an American business consultant. So I did find a place to get a job and it took a good three, four months of getting the right paperwork, getting the right authorizations before before I was actually allowed to start working. I would not work without a work permit. It's illegal. You can get a lot of trouble. Uh, it's, not, it's not advisable to do. So getting a work permit, challenging. Uh, to give a little background, I worked for an app company that uh, supplied an app that was as close to gambling as possible without actually being gambling. They're called skill-based games. But anyway, they hired me. Niha, hello. They hired me to get around all of the anti-money laundering checks um, that, was, that was preventing them from doing business in America. I eventually decided what they were doing put me in some legal risk that I wasn't of uh, comfortable with taking so they said you can either do what we say or we can't employ you anymore we parted ways no big deal uh, I haven't had a job realistically since then but uh, we're just waiting okay so those are some of the challenges that I've been going through while I lived in China here okay take a look we're, too, we're still good we're still good on the time so, uh, where we are now, right now, I'm kind of a house husband. Uh, I've been putting some business plans together because I have a lot of time. Most of my day consists of walking in the park, doing laundry, cleaning the house, taking care of the dog, you know, um, making sure my wife is comfortable by providing her all the things she needs while she at work. It's really really convenient if you order something in the mail and it comes in the middle of the day to have somebody to be able to pick it up that's me i'm kind of the house husband trophy trophy husband complete i'm completely okay with that uh Xingyi is totally okay with that we have more than enough money to pay our bills we don't uh we don't, we're not rich but we live a very comfortable life things here are very affordable we don't really go without anything um so we're we're, we're pretty we're pretty consistent there. Uh, we're waiting for the one year. Now, I started this project, Countdown to Permanent Residency. Once you get permanent residency in China, all of those things that I said was a challenge about getting a work permit and the authorizations to get the right job becomes much easier. You get a, a foreign uh, foreigner ID with a Chinese identification number and you're allowed to work under the, poor, uh, the power of your foreign residency, which means you don't need a work permit. You know, uh, you don't need a visa. Every six months, every year, you have to go get a new visa. So in exactly one year, I will be putting my application in for permanent residency, which will make it much, much easier to live and work in China. It's awesome. Uh, that's where we sit now with my employment status. So the next year, I'm just going to build business plans, explore business ideas, all the things that you wish you could do with the extra time that you spend at work right now. I have the opportunity to do that right now. And it's really hard not to realize that that's the opportunity that I have right now. But I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to use the time as best I can. Some days I don't really do much. Today I went for a run. I'm making this video. And uh, later on we'll probably go out to eat. But uh, beautiful weather today. You'll see so many people up. Still doing good on time. Okay. Uh, I was going to try to keep it under 45 minutes. But that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at now. I'm waiting for permanent residency. I'm putting business plans together and exploring a few options while also not breaking Chinese law by working illegally here. And uh, making videos every once in a while to share my life with my friends. 
So that brings us to future plans, right? What, what are the plans for the future? Well, I'm gonna try my best to start some hobbies, throw some business plans out there and explore them, see which ones take, and if one of them takes off, then that's great. I mean, that's a success story in itself. Uh, I'm gonna start working with Stained Glass. I got a 360 VR project with uh, a good friend back home. We're gonna explore some new technology into showing houses. Very interesting stuff, you know, and this is all possible because I've had the time to explore the technology. I've had the time to just mess around with stuff um, and, and learn about it more to try to apply it to new ideas in the industry, right? Um, some import and export, you know, the very generic uh, buy stuff cheap in China, sell it for a little bit more in America. So we're learning how to export different goods. These are all, these are all really useful skills that you really, you really don't know until you do it. So we're going to throw some, throw some business plans and some money at the wall. We're going to see exactly where it takes us. That's kind of our plan for the future, and I have a year. I have exactly one year before I can start looking for jobs. I'm maybe a little bit more if I don't get approved for the permanent residency, but that's our plan for now. Comfortable life, lots of good food, uh, try to do some business plans, pick up a couple hobbies, just live a real comfortable life. Uh, the main focus is to be, to be relaxed to enjoy some life, not be so stressed out. Uh, because I got to admit, as a foreigner living in China, it's lonely. It's really lonely. And you get stressed out. Some days, you're just like, ah, it's too much. Everybody's speaking Mandarin around you. You feel like a moron no matter how much you study when you can't like express yourself around other people because of the language challenges. Uh, you don't get any of your friends from back home. Your family's not around. You don't know anybody. To try to go out and make friends is difficult. There are so, so many challenges for a foreigner. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. It's, it's like, it's worth it. It's totally worth it. Because if you were home, you would have a lot more challenges as well. But, but anyway. It's a beautiful day in the park. There are a lot of people taking pictures, a lot of models in Nanhu Park. Because the weather today is, is like one of the first really nice days where the weather is comfortable on the weekend. And that's why I'm really happy I can put this video together and show everybody Nanhu Park, the neighborhood I live in, for about, I don't know, 45 minutes. We're, we're about 30 minutes in. So 30 minutes seems like a good a good, a good amount of time for the video. Uh, if, if you're still watching, I want to say thanks a lot for sticking around to the end. I know that I got a little long winded in the middle, but that's my story. That's how I got here. Uh, that's where I am now, and that's what we plan on the future. So I'll try to put videos out uh, as I do interesting things. I don't see the point of putting a video out just to put a video out if, if, uh, if, if there's nothing interesting. You know, for the last month or two, I've just been sitting at home working on business plans. There's not really, that's not really video material, so I don't want to bore you with that stuff. So anyway, I love you. I really do love you guys. I think you're awesome, and I'll see you in the next video.